Okay. Uh, Hotel family, good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here again to Brooklyn, good old Brooklyn. And it's an honor to, to share with you uh, the latest findings from my excavations in Egypt and then to introduce to you a new friend, um, as, as a colleague of mine said, a brother from another mother. <laughs> We've been hanging out for the last three weeks. We were in the Nile Valley Conference three weeks ago. We were in uh, Washington uh, for our Metamorphosis Conference last Friday. We were in Philadelphia on Thursday for a fundraiser at the African American History Museum. And Friday, we were at the uh, 23rd Annual uh, Jacques Chekanta Jacques Conference in uh, Philadelphia. And we were making the rounds. He does his last presentation today, then he heads back to uh, Spain tomorrow. And it's been a wonderful journey, it's been a wonderful opportunity for us to bond, to share information, to learn from each other, and I believe that we have established a foundation that our great-great-grandchildren will benefit from. So you all will see for yourself, judge for yourself. Anyway, I'm here today to talk about our project. Uh, the ACER Restoration Project is um, a project that is dedicated to two brothers, two men. Is dedicated to restoring the tomb of Karakamon, the 25th Dynasty tomb of a priest named Karakamon, and Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III, who I'm sure all of you all are familiar with. Dr. Hilliard, as you know, passed in Cairo, Egypt on August the 13th, 2007. Dr. Hilliard was a, a dear friend, was a brother, was a colleague. Many of you all know that he wrote the introduction to my first book, From the Grout of Fowl, in 1989. Gosh, it seems like a lifetime ago. But it was Dr. Hilliard's name. Uh, on my book, which helped sell that book. So I'm forever grateful to him. And um, when he died, I dedicated this project, the Ace of Restoration Project, to his memory. And the purpose of the project, or one of the purposes of the project, speaks to uh, the words that Sheikh Abdeljok gave us back in, in the 70s. He said that the history of black Africa will remain suspended in air and cannot be written correctly until African historians dare to connect it to the history of Egypt. Here's an African who was forced to write three dissertations recording his own history before it was finally accepted. And the, and the issue, one of the fundamental <coughs> issues that we're faced with today is the fact here in 2011 we still have to prove that the Egyptians, ancient Kemites, were black, were African. We have to hear Baval speak this evening, that issue is settled once and for all. We have the concrete evidence, and it simply now becomes a matter of <coughs> spreading the word to as many people as possible so that we can free as many minds as possible and then turn the world right side up. So we are living at a very critical point in history. Just to speak to Dr. Jobs, issue about how our history has been recorded by others. Speak to the issue that Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, discussed in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro. What we've come to understand <coughs> when we study history is that it's not only the so-called Negro who's been miseducated, everybody has been miseducated. So once we free minds, we're not just freeing African minds or black minds or white minds, we're freeing every single mind. We change the energy of this planet we change the way that we will move through society forever. This is where we are right now. But just to demonstrate this point, um, it was Harry Truman who said that there's nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. And history is exactly what that word implies, his story. Whenever someone tells they, their story, they tell you what they want you to know, and normally don't tell you what you need to know for your own personal growth and benefit. So just to prove this point, how we all have been miseducated, I just want to ask you a few simple questions. What do you call this building? Pyramid. Shh, be quiet. <laughs> what do you call this statue? Sphinx. The Sphinx. What do you call the country where you find these two objects? Egypt. 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 Very good. Very good. But you're wrong. Why are you wrong? Anytime someone says something, you should always ask for evidence. Don't accept anything anybody says simply because they said always ask for evidence. Why am I saying you're wrong? Because the word pyramid, Sphinx, and Egypt are Greek words. They're Greek words. This building and that statue were created thousands of years before Greece came into existence. 
So if you do not know the original name of a person, place, or thing, you will never be able to understand why that object was built, what it is, the purpose that it serves, or what it means to you personally. So our interest in Nile Valley studies, our entry, interest in the history of Kemet is to begin to recover the original names and the meanings associated with them so our knowledge can expand from that point on. Pyramid is a Greek word which means little flat cake, like this table. Pancake, does that look like a pancake? <laughs> the original name for that structure is Mir. Mir in the original language means the place of ascension. Mir were built over tombs as vehicles through which the soul of the deceased within those tombs would ascend into heaven. <clears throat> Egyptologists now are referring to these structures as resurrection machines because they're now beginning to understand their function. Sphinx is a Greek word which means to strangle or to hold. In the medical profession, Dr. Brown, you will acknowledge that there are uh, muscles in the body called sphincter muscles which hold things in. The pupil of your eyes is sphincter muscle. Some of you all who are eating dinner right now are sitting on a sphincter muscle. It's obviously working because I'm sitting on leaving the auditorium. The word sphinx means to strangle or to hold. The original name for this statue is Her M. Aket, Heru on the horizon. Heru, the son of Asar and Aset, sitting on the horizon, the place where the sun rises and sets. And Baval will share with you that not only is it sitting on the horizon, but it's looking at its mirror image in the head. All of this means something. And once you begin to understand the, the history, the culture, the language, the philosophy of the people who created these objects, you can then begin to appreciate the full essence of what they created. And it means more to you. The name of the country that the Greeks called Egypt was originally known as Kemet. Kemet is a word which literally means the nation, the town, the city of the blacks, not the black soil as National Geographic would have you believe. So understanding the name helps to reorient you. Once you've been properly reoriented, your understanding of everything you see changes instantaneously. What we understand through the study of Kemet, Kemet is that Kemet is the oldest documented civilization on the planet. There's also a nation of first. We know through the study of Kemetic history and culture that the Africans who established this now Valley culture and civilization were the first human beings to study the sky. They established the first calendars of 365 and a quarter days. We will we'll talk more about the significance of these calendars and when they were first established and established. <coughs> they were the first people to divide the day into 24 hours. <coughs> they were the first human beings to write, created an alphabet known as Medunetair, which the Greeks later referred to as hieroglyphics or sacred carvings. The first nation state governed by kings, administered by civil servants. The first civil servants in human history lived along the Nile River, your ancestors. They established through this government the first middle class teachers, healers, architects, engineers. That is a part of your legacy. That is a part of your story, our story, which many of us have never been exposed to. And as a consequence, sometimes when this information is shared with you, you may reject it because it, it doesn't jive with what you have been taught. And, and I understand that rejection. It's natural on, on, a, on a basic fundamental psychological level because people automatically reject information that is new to them because it makes them feel uncomfortable. But if you can begin to study the information, examine the information, mull it around in your mind for a few minutes, then this truth will resonate within your heart and soul and begin a transformative process that will change your life and the lives of those that you love. Dr. Asa Hilliard gave us a framework with which we could understand and appreciate the history of chemistry. Again, now about the culture and civilization is the oldest documented civilization known to man. Dr. Hilliard divided the civilization of ancient Kemet into four golden ages. 
The first golden age occurred during dynasties three through six when all the great mere or pyramids were constructed. The second golden age occurred during dynasties 11 and 12 when all of the great literature, philosophical literature, the wisdom texts were created. The third golden age was dynasties 18 and 19 when all of the great temples were built. When the capital moved um, up south to Waset or modern day Luxor, when the kings built the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, and the nobles, they began to bury their dead in mountains. They look like mere. The fourth golden age, the period in time, period in comedic history, which Dr. John Henry Clark, beloved ancestor Dr. John Henry Clark, referred to as Africa's last great walk in the sun. It was during the fourth golden age when Africans from Kush or modern day Sudan began to make a great and mighty march down the Nile River into Kenya to restore the land of their ancestors because Kemet had fallen on hard times. Libyans had controlled uh, many regions of Kemet and other warlords were battling for control of different towns. But it was the Kushites who established the 25th dynasty, restored the land of their ancestors, rebuilt temples, monuments, Shabaka, the second major king of the 25th dynasty, wrote the Shabaka stone because he found the original text in the library had been worm-eaten, so he carved it on stone so it would last forever. It now is in the <coughs> British Museum. It's lasted for thousands of years, over 2,700 years. We study this history and culture. I'm, I'm particularly interested in this particular point in time in history because this is the era of the tomb that we're now excavating, the tomb of Karaka Moon. But what we know through the study of Kemet is that 6,253 years after the founding of Kemet, 2,758 years after the 25th dynasty, we all know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the past has been erased and that the erasure has been forgotten. We now know that historical facts were falsified and presented as historical truths in order to separate Kush from Kemet, Kemet from Egypt, Egypt from Africa, and African people from their own history and culture. So we study this information to regain knowledge that was once forbidden, once outlawed. We study, we knew, use this knowledge, we gain wisdom and then apply it in our lives to change how we move through life. This is what I've been doing for almost 30 years now, since I made my first trip to Egypt with Dr. Ben in 1980. Pleased to say that as of this past July, I made my 42nd trip to Egypt. And of all of the trips that I've made to Egypt over the last 31 years, because of my involvement in this excavation, I now begin to understand why I have been drawn to this nation for so long. And now I've been prepared for the work that I'm doing now. 19, in 2008, I met this woman here, Dr. Lena Pistakova, who was born in Russia, came to the United States, received her PhD in Egyptology at New York University, trained by Bernard Bothmer, who was the foremost expert in the 25th dynasty. So she is now regarded as a world authority on the art and history of the late period, the 25th and 26th <laughs> dynasty. Dr. Pistakova worked in Luxor on the West Bank of Luxor restoring several tombs. And in her spare time, she was searching for the tomb of Karakamun, which was first discovered by two Britishmen in 1824, and was last seen by an Austrian by the name of um, Dieter Eidner in the 1970s, who wrote the definitive book on the tomb of Karakamun. And then in the 1990s, the tomb disappeared. She had a general idea where it was located, and in her spare time, she went looking for it. Found it in 2006. And because of the significance of this tomb, the tomb of Karakamun, which was the second Kushite tomb built in Kemet, one of the grandest Kushite tombs ever constructed, she understood the significance. She understood the relationship between Kush and Kemet. And she went to her employer and asked them for financial assistance with the excavation. And they told her, 
Let me backtrack for a second. The 25th dynasty is significant because 25th dynasty is the only dynasty in Egyptian history which traditional Egyptologists would acknowledge was a black dynasty. They've given us the 25th dynasty because they know that they came from Kush, <coughs> black Africa. We have to fight, as Diop had to fight, to prove that the earlier <coughs> kings were also of African ancestry. Dr. Lena knows the story. And she went to her employer at the time, the Metropolitan Museum, told them of her discovery, shared with them that this tomb of Karakamun would connect Kush with Kemet. And do you know what they told her? They said, leave this alone. They told her, these are not your people. But she said, this is history. This is an important story that everyone needs to know. Leave this alone. <clears throat> so what this courageous woman did was to quit her job. She used her own money to fund the excavation. And the excavation of a tomb is a very expensive process. And as she ran out of funds, she started using her own credit cards. And when she maxed out her credit cards, she started using her daughter's college tuition to pay for this work that she believed in. She was that dedicated to restoring the tomb of Karakamun. So when I met her in July of 2008, she had run out of funds. And you could imagine how desperate she was. I was introduced to her by a mutual friend. She gave me a personal tour of this tomb. And because of my association with Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Hilliard, and others, I knew instantaneously what was there. And I made a commitment to her to get the word out, to go into my community, and to raise funds. In the fall of 2008, when I returned to Washington, I come up with the idea to name the project in honor of Dr. A.C. Hilliard. This, this tomb of Karakamun is in an area of Egypt known as South Assasif. South Assasif is sandwiched between the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. It is across the road from the Ramesseum, for those of you who all have been to Kemet before, right down the street from the Temple of Hatshepsut. So we named the project the ASA Restoration Project, which stands for the ACG Hilliard South Assasif Restoration Project. I traveled to Atlanta to meet Dr. Hilliard's family. I shared with them my vision. They gave me their blessings, gave me the permission to use uh, their husband's and their father's name on this project. And we began raising funds for the excavation of this tomb. So everything that I will show <coughs> to you it happened between 2008 and 2011 happened because of the support of all of you who gave to the ACER Restoration Project. It is a 501c3, so the contribution to this project is tax deductible. So I want you to see how your investment has paid off in the rewriting of history. Now, this tomb is about, was built around 25 feet below ground level built out of solid limestone. The construction of this tomb is not architecture, it is sculpture. In the 1990s, the tomb collapsed, the ceiling of the tomb collapsed, and it disappeared in the sand. And there was a village nearby, well, I'll get to that in a second, but this is Karakamon. Karakamon, his name means my car, my spirit is known by our men, the unseen, omnipotent creator. This is where he was buried, and this is where he worked, on the west bank of Luxor, the Temple of Karnak. The Temple of Karnak is the largest temple complex ever constructed by human beings on this planet. It is a mile <coughs> wide, a mile and a half deep. Within this temple is the Holy of Holies of Amen. Amen. You've heard that word before. Amen is a comedic word which means the unseen presence of the Creator. Prophet Amen was responsible. He was the first Ark priest at Karnak Temple. He was responsible for doing the morning libations before the Holy of Holies of this temple. That was his job. 2008, this is what Dr. Lena found. South Assasi. The ceiling of the tomb had collapsed, left an indentation in the sand, 
And the people who resided in the village right near this tomb dumped their garbage in that hole. She hired several workers and they removed hundreds and hundreds of tons of garbage in 110 degree heat. This is dedication. <clears throat> they began digging down deeper and deeper and deeper until they began to find things. They began to find presence of this tomb. So let me just show you, and this is the first pillared hall, the tomb of Karakamon. There were eight pillars in the pillared hall. The pillars collapsed, the roof collapsed, everything <coughs> fell to the ground, was filled in with sand, rocks, and then garbage, which all had to be removed. So here are a couple of um, pictures taken over the past three years, 2008, 2009, 2010. By 2010, we had completely excavated the first pillar hall and exposed the stumps of the eight original pillars. <coughs> and then we began the process of restoring the first of the eight pillars in the hall. The other seven pillars were covered with mud bricks in order to prevent them from being damaged as the workers moved in and out and through this site. This is a photograph from uh, July of last year. We had begun the re reconstruction or restoration of the first pillar, of this first pillar. These pillars were originally 10 feet tall. And we focused our energies on this area here, which is the second pillar hall, where we hope to find the actual burial chamber of Karakamo. But part of the Ace of Restoration Project is not just to fund the excavation of this tomb of Karakamo, but to take people over as part of the mission to participate <coughs> in this process. So I want to share with you some of what goes on. These are members from uh, our August mission. We've taken uh, our June mission. We've taken five missions over to, to Egypt over the last three years. And most of what we do is registration. <coughs> as we dig through the debris, we find fragments of the ceiling, fragments of the <coughs> pillars, the pilasters, Fragments of the walls, which are all covered with glyphs, which are all painted. <coughs> fragments range from very small pieces to huge pieces. Every single fragment has to be numbered, has to be registered on, the, on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with all of the specific details of that particular fragment, a description, measurements, a drawing. That's registration. We have found to date over 17,000 fragments. Then each piece has to be photographed. Once the piece has been registered in the photograph, it goes into storage where that piece will be used ultimately to reconstruct the tomb of Karakamon. And then all the registration forms have to be entered into a computer database so that we have multiple copies of all of the data. The majority of people who come and work on this mission are doing registration, photography, and data entry. We open participation to this mission to anyone who is willing to come to Egypt with us to work. This is not a vacation. And I'll get into more details about what is required if you're interested in being part of the ASA restoration project. We have to pay for everything. We pay for the workers. We have approximately 76 people who work for us. <coughs> workers, conservators, stone cutters, stone masons, we pay for the tools, we pay for the lumber. This is how we entered the tomb last year. We entered it from the, from the west. We have to rent the, the railroad ties uh, to support the workers coming in and out, the heavy equipment that came in and out. We had to rent them because we didn't have enough money to buy them outright. It costs about $10,000 a month to meet all of our financial obligations. And again, for the last three years, we have been paying that. We buy the stone, the limestone that is used to reconstruct the walls, the pillars. And as you can see here, we have to use uh, low-tech means to bring these stones, these one-time stone blocks, into the tomb. We work with these men. We live with these men. Communicate with them regularly. And here is the pillar that we were 
restoring. And here is a photograph from uh, early July of this year where we restored this pillar to its original height of 10 feet. We're about to put on the arbitrage and then ultimately after we restore all eight pillars in the first pillar hall, we hope to construct the ceiling, reconstruct the ceiling. This is my cousin who was with us, who was an engineer. And he was giving us advice as to how we could best rebuild the other pillars and save time, uh, money, and resources. So we need architects, we need engineers, we need people with skills who can help us do the work and restore the tomb of this 25th dynasty priest. Here's a photograph from last July. Here's a photograph from this July. When we completely excavated, here's the first pillar hall with the first pillar in place. Here's a second pillar hall which we completely excavated this past season. Now what's challenging about this process is that we, we oftentimes don't have money to buy all the materials that we need. We, we did not always have enough money to pay for the workers. They paid every Thursday. And when we didn't have enough money in the Acer Restoration Project bank account, I had, to, I had to catch a boat across the river to the East Bank to an ATM machine to use my personal ATM card to withdraw money to pay these men to buy the tools. And I don't mind telling you, my wife prays that we get more assistance <laughs> so uh, we can ensure that we'll have a house to live in next year. But as I was struggling with making payroll and, and dealing with all the ramifications of not making payroll, I began to find myself calling on Barack Obama for guidance and assistance. And I like to think that I cultivated a relationship with my brother, Barack Obama. And this one particular occasion, I knew that time was tight, money was short, and we couldn't just afford to dig anywhere. And I found myself calling on Barack Obama and asking him for guidance, asking him for direction, asking Barack Obama to tell me, where should we be digging? And the voice that I would go to my grave knowing was more inspiration than imagination said, have them dig right here. So I went to Dr. Lena and said, Lena, let me have a couple of guys and, and I want them to dig right here. <coughs> well, well, Tony, why? You know, we, we have other things to be doing. Alina, just, just give me two guys. <laughs> but why? Alina, trust me. <laughs> give me two guys. She gave me two guys. They started digging. And two days later, she shouted out, Tony, Tony, we found it. We found stairs leading down into the earth, leading down into the burial chamber of Karakamun. I was excited, but I had to leave the next day to bring over members of the next mission, the August mission. So while I was going, Dr. Lena was giving me updates on how the excavation was going, what they were finding. She told me, Tony, we found something incredible. You won't believe your eyes when you see it, and we're going to save it for you for your birthday my birthday present. So I came back two weeks later with my daughter, Atlantis, who many of you all know and many of you all often ask me about. She just turned 29 last Saturday. Uh, many of you all know Atlantis because of her first book. I took her to Egypt when she was seven years old. We published her book when she was eight. She was the youngest published author in America. She's made five trips to Egypt with me and has participated in the last two excavations. We came back and we came back and they had dug out this hole, which was an entrance to the burial compartment of Karakamu. So we went inside of the compartment, climbed over these limestone chips, all of this debris, climbed down into this hole, which is now some 30 feet below ground level. Climbing down in, into this space, and here's Dr. Lena coming down behind her. And as we entered this room, which is about half the width of this room, imagine again, all of this is carved out of living limestone. And when we got on the floor, over in the corner was a shaft about four feet by six feet. And this shaft went down into the earth another 26 feet. We didn't have at the time a 30-foot ladder. 
to the sin and to the shaft. So you have to be creative. We tied together two 15-foot ladders. And we made our way down into the burial chamber of Karakamo. And when my daughter reached the bottom of the ladder, we still fit together. And as a father, I made an executive decision to have her go in first so that she would be the first African-American in history in the tomb of Karakamo. That's how you make history. Mm. You don't wait for someone else to give you permission to do what you've always had the capacity to do. You do it. Right. And then you write about what you've done mm. and let others revel in your story. Mm. So do you want to see the inside of the world? Yes. yes. You sure? <coughs> Let me get a drink of water. <laughs> Here's to you, Rob. <laughs> Okay, so this is inside the burial chamber of Karakamo. Oh, wow. This tomb, uh, this tomb was built 2,700 years ago. Unfortunately, it had already been robbed by the Rasul family, Abdella El Rasul, family of the most notorious tomb robbers in Egyptian history. They've been robbing tombs for 13 generations. And they're very good at what they do. <coughs> they build their homes over where they suspect tombs are. They drill holes through the floor until they find something. And then they raid the tomb of its contents. Use it to finance their lifestyle. The tomb had already been raided. And then not only did they rob the tomb of its contents, but they filled the tomb and the shaft with debris to cover the tracks. So we're sitting on about four feet of debris. The floor to ceiling height in this tomb is about seven feet. We're sitting on four feet of debris, and my head is barely touching the ceiling. My daughter and I spent, <clears throat> this is my birthday present, my daughter and I spent a week in this burial chamber, excavating, photographing, and documenting everything that we found. So we worked six hours a day, six days a week. <coughs> So we had some very serious daddy-daughter time. <laughs> Good conversation, rich conversations. Okay? And while we were there, on one occasion, my daughter Atlanta said, Daddy, look what I found. She held this object in her hand. See what she has? Do you see what she's holding in her hand? It's a hand. It's a hand. Notice the size of the hand. My daughter's a very petite young lady. But the hand is smaller than her hand. So what does that mean? The hand of a child. We had earlier found two adult skulls. So we were led to believe at the time that possibly this is, was a family crib of Barack Amun, his wife, and their child. And so we were so excited about being there. So excited. But there were other things about this tomb that were also equally excited. We excavated all of the stairs leading down into the burial compartment. Within this burial compartment, there were a total of four burial chambers. So this was like a family crypt that Karak Amun had designed for his family. So we're still piecing together his story as we reconstruct his tomb because there's a lot that we don't know about him. But what's significant about his tomb is this carving at the top of the staircase. The carving we later discovered, thanks to an Egyptologist from Spain who was part of the mission. This text is pyramid text from the 5th dynasty, 2,000 years earlier. And it confirms the mission of the Kushites to restore the land and the legacy of their ancestors. They engaged in an act of Sankofa after they had restored Kemet reclaim their land, and then they reached back 2,000 years into the past and brought the best of their ancestral knowledge to the present moment, recorded it on this tomb, and left it for all humanity. Mm. Left it for us to find. Pyramid text comes from the Pyramid of Nas, the first pyramid or mirror to have text inscribed in the burial chamber. There's no text inside any mirror. 
only in the burial chambers below the meal. This is the oldest religious text known to man. The oldest original text known to man in its original language. And this text speaks of the soul of the deceased person traveling into heaven, into to the nighttime sky, to a region of the sky known as Sahu, which we know today as Orion. And the soul would journey to that location where it would be reborn. First story of resurrection. First story of a soul. First story of judgment. Here's the name of Karakamun, Karake Amen. And below that are the glyphs, Ma'at Keru, true of voice. The words that a sar says to the soul after they've been vindicated, after their heart is balanced on the scale of mind. And they have been determined to be true of voice. They can make the journey to Sahu to be resurrected. This is in Karakamun's tomb. This is a part of their ancestral legacy left for us to find and to share with you. This facility of the burial chamber of Karakamun. Look at this image of Newt. You'll never see this face on the Discovery Channel, on the History Channel, for obvious reasons. But what's significant about this image of Newt is that it is an accurate portrayal of the nighttime sky. Newt is a nature who swallows the sun. Her face faces the west. She swallows the sun when it sets in the west. The sun is red when it sets in the west. And then it moves through her body, through the nighttime sky, and she gives birth to the sun, kept break in the east. Gives birth to the sun through her womb. So here's an image, an ancient African image of a female personality giving birth to the sun, the oldest symbol for God. How's that for a liberating theology. A female, a sister giving birth to God. Huh? That's all a part of the history. That's all a part of the written record that is all in the tomb of Karakamon. And we have it. Nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can distort this story because we are there to record it and pass it on to you. This is an accurate portrayal of the nighttime sky. To the left of Newt you can see the constellation of the Big Dipper. Robert's going to talk about that and the significance of that. To the right of the Big Dipper. Robert's going to talk about that and the significance of that. To the right of Newt is a constellation of Sahu and Zepet. The constellation of Sahu, which is uh, uh, the comedic name for Orion or Asar, the place where the soul of the deceased goes to be resurrected. Saw so the oldest story recorded history of a person who died and was resurrected. And then next to Asar is his wife Aset, Sepetit, who we know better by a group name Isis. All of this is in Karakamun's tomb. All of this is old kingdom <clears throat> theology, old kingdom astronomy, old kingdom architecture. That's Senko, or what is commonly referred to as retroactive. Remember, remembrances. So, this is last year, my daughter and I in the tomb of Karakamun. This is July. I was in the tomb after it had been totally excavated. We can now stand on the floor. My daughter can stand on the floor and touch newts. Touch the sky, fingertip to fingertip. So, for those of you all who've read the book, uh, my first trip to Africa, you've seen this photograph of a Halloween costume that I made for her when she was seven years old. As a single parent, I decided whether or not I was going to allow her to participate in the Halloween celebration. But I also decided I was not going to allow her to go to a Halloween party as a figment of someone else's imagination. Snow White, Cinderella, no. <laughs> that is not a part of our cultural reference. I, I wanted her to go as an African personality. So I reached back into my collective memory and remember this image that I had seen of Newt in Kenneth? So I took a pair of black leotards and painted the sun disc that Newt just swallowed, moving through her body, painted stars on her legs. 
got a little purse and wrote a little name tag and said, Newton had a drawing of Newton. I said, baby, when you go to that Halloween party, don't let anybody call you nut. Your name is Newton. <laughs> and this is who you represent. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about it, when she was in elementary school, every year I would dress her as a, as a different comedic personality. She went as Queen T one year. And every year she would win first prize in the Halloween Festival contest. So much so, you know, there were other kids coming in as Freddy Krueger. You know, imagine this. Kids coming in dressed as monsters. And we, and we wonder why our children act like devils. If you want them to be something, have them be something. You have that power. You've got that ability. So we kind of changed the dynamic at our elementary school, so much so that after about the third year of her winning Halloween costumes, uh, there was a young brother who came to the Halloween party one day dressed as Imhotep. That's how you do it. That's how you make your history real. It's no longer in the past, it's in the present. And it shapes your future. That's what history is supposed to do. That's what real history does. <clears throat> so this excavation is a heart-stopping and a heartbreaking experience. It's heart-stopping because we find these news. We never know what we're going to find. We never know what's underneath the soil as we're excavating. And sometimes we find things that get us very excited. In this particular instance, we're in the burial chamber. And as the workmen were removing the final layer of sand and hit floor level, they found a corner, a right angle, right here. And Alina was so excited, she said, well, maybe this helps to explain some of the anomalies that we found in this tomb. And certain things here just don't <coughs> look right. They, I mean, they, they aren't right. But maybe this isn't the burial chamber. Maybe this is an antechamber. And maybe this is a shaft that leads to the actual burial chamber. Or maybe it's a staircase. We didn't know. So it took us a week before this floor was finally cleared. And once it was cleared, we were disappointed to find out that it was a burial pit. It wasn't a shaft. It wasn't a staircase. You know, Karakamon will give it, and Karakamon will take it away. <laughs> you know? But this is what we have. This is what we have to work with. We make the best of what we have. And Dr. Lena was explaining the significance of the burial pit. The burial pit is a feature that attests to an attribute of Asar's tomb in Abydos. And there were several uh, design features in Karakamun's tomb that mirrored his effort to recreate the sacred burial place of Asar. So we see in the pyramid text a reference to becoming Asar. We see within the, the design of his tomb uh, design references, architectural references to being Asar. So whenever you see something repeated over and over again, somebody's trying to tell you something. The challenge is whether or not you have it within you to understand what is not being said. That comes through the study. Here's Karakamun. Here's one of the most magnificent carvings of Karakamun, the larger than life-size carving of Karakamun. Everything about this image is old king, old school. This is old school. This is when Kemet was at his best period of the mirror buildings. The furniture that he's sitting on is old kingdom furniture. The clothing, the kilt that he's wearing, old kingdom clothing. His pose is old kingdom. Even take note of this dog sitting underneath his chair. Check this out. Wonderful art. Wonderful sculpture. 25th Dynasty. This is us. This is us. And as, since I was the only person there at the site, I'll show you how to do it. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I would like to think that maybe there is some connection, maybe there is some motivation for my interest, for my fascination in this history. Who knows? We'll see. But, as I'm winding down now, you're very familiar with Robert. This is an aerial shot of the first and second pillar hall. And I want to give you a taste of, of, of what <coughs> this actual excavation is like. Here's a floor plan. As we were excavating this past season, the season ended on September the 15th. We closed the tomb 
September the 15th, and we will reopen it in May. We only excavate four months out of the year. But it, we found two new tombs in the second pillar hall as we were excavating. It is very exciting because you never know what you're going to find. And so here's a photograph of the second pillar hall after it's been cleaned. And there's a, a pillar here, a pillar there. They've both been destroyed when the ceiling crashed. And on this pillar here is an image of a person. And we found the name of that person. His name is Nesminapet. And we found a description of that person, his brother. We don't know yet if it's the biological brother of Karakamun or a brother within the priesthood. But we found this chapel and we found a shaft and his tomb. So let me just walk you through the process of, of, of discovery so that you, you can get a taste for what it's like if you decide to, to support the ACE Restoration Project and come to be a part of this mission. I want you to see what you will see. We found, as they cleaned the floor, they found a corner, and they began digging down. That's an indication of a shaft. They began <coughs> digging down, and they get to a certain depth where two workers are in the shaft. One is digging, puts the dirt in the basket, the other lifts the basket out, and then it's taken up and dumped. And then you get to a certain point where uh, the other worker can no longer lift it up, so you hook up a pulley, take the dirt out. And so what I'm gonna show you is a short clip short film that takes you through three stages of the excavation process where in the first clip you see my daughter actually pulling the dirt up using the winch. The second clip we dug out the shaft which is about 16 feet deep and I'm down, I went down in the ladder with Dr. Alina's daughter Luda looking into this hole. And the final clip is actual footage inside of the burial chamber of Nesmino. Hasn't aired on national TV yet, but it's worthy of a national TV audience, and that's you. Okay? So let's make sure we've got audio here and everything is in place. Here at the site, helping to clear out a new shaft here in the tomb of Kuraka Moon. We're going to try her hand at the, uh, at the winch. Pulley. All right, all right. Give us some slack. Give us some slack. Give us some slack. Yes, there you go. All right, all right. Now, pull, 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 pull. Hey, hey. Pull. 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 All right. Coordination. It's good. It's good. All right.
around. It's like this gym space. And all of this right here is sitting on top of a huge hole. What? Yeah. yeah, it's like there's this huge space underneath. Underneath this is like this huge space that goes back and goes down. And all along this wall is just rubble. I see pieces of mummy. Uh, go take a look. Yeah. Do you see any walls or ceiling? Or I, any? Can't, I can't see any ceiling. And I can't really identify any walls because of all the rubble. Do you have a camera? Uh, I've got my iPhone. But uh, it's, it's probably too dark to get a decent picture. Yeah. Mm. Unless, yeah, see? Yeah, you see what I mean? You see that big hole? It's like a hole that just goes down. Yeah, don't slide down there too far now. Yeah, you're gonna get stuck. Yeah, you're gonna get stuck. Yeah. Inside the newly found burial chamber, the newly found shaft in the tomb of Karakamun. This is the area where we found the inscription that read his brother. So this may in fact be uh, the shaft of the brother of uh, Karakamun. We won't know until later. The pieces of uh, mummified uh, remains, as well as uh, some coffins with some inscriptions on them. <coughs> so we'll have to take everything out before we know exactly what it is we had part of uh, newly discovered uh, burial chamber of uh, Kwakamon's brother. Uh, I guess we're about. Uh, Maybe 20 feet or so on the ground, uh, just inside the burial chamber, there are uh, remains of mummy, there are pieces of coffin, and there's also debris left behind by the uh, notorious uh, Rasul family. Uh, I feel like that was quite bad, you know, picking up the pieces, uh, pieces of animal bones, human remains. Bamboo pottery, uh, some pieces of coffin, and some modern uh, debris. So uh, we'll have to give you a ready report later on once we sift it through everything and we know exactly what we have. Moment, this is Tom Browner, representing the Ace of Restoration Project here in the newly found tomb here the site. Okay, so that's what is that? Now, uh, why do you down now? And I just want to share with you some of what we found in this burial chamber and some of the other burial chambers. Uh, climbing up, we found skulls. We must have found at least a dozen skulls. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's Severed body parts. The mummies were totally destroyed by the Mishuls in their quest to find gold and jewelry. But what's interesting about uh, this finger here, we found several fingers in which the fingernail was covered with gold leaf, 24 karat gold leaf, wow. mm -hmm. which is a sign of royalty. Uh, we suspect, based on the size of the tomb and the quality of the decorations in this tomb, that Karaka Moon may have been a member of the royal family. We know for a fact that he lived during the times of Shabaka and Shabiku. So he may have been a brother of Shabaka, may have been a son of Shabaka. We don't know yet. We haven't found the evidence, but I believe it's waiting there to be discovered. We found teeth, jaws, dozens and dozens of pieces of body parts. So we ended the uh, excavation season having completely excavated the, uh, the second pillar hall. And the, the last thing that we thought we had to do was to excavate the entrance to the tomb in the east, the open courtyard. The tombs that the Kushites built in Kemet were temple tombs. They built the tombs underground, but they attached to the front of the tomb a temple in which the living could have direct and constant access to their ancestors. 
we began excavating the entrance to the tomb, the open courtyard. Here's a photograph from the east looking west for the back of the tomb. I uh, had left in mid-July, came back to the States, get some more money, sent money back. I was getting regular updates from Melina. She told me in early August that as they were excavating the open courtyard, they found these interesting features. They found the molding above what is probably a doorway, a false door. And they found this interesting design which she had never seen in any tomb in Egypt. A week later, they dug out the site. We had a better idea of what we were looking at. And here is that interesting design, this unique design to any tomb in Kimberley. It's a series of five concentric circles. It looks like half a bullseye. It's never been found in any tomb in Kemet. So we're inclined to believe that it was an artistic style that was introduced to Kemet from Kush. Alina sent me these pictures, and I began doing some research, and I think I found an interesting leak. Adinkra Hini, the oldest Adinkra symbol in Ghana. Adinkra Hini is a symbol associated with kingship, with royalty, with leadership. At the recent Nile Valley Conference, I had an opportunity to talk with uh, several brothers from West Africa, from Ghana, Senegal, and Mali, and ask them to investigate this to see if, there were, uh, if this was a possible, uh, possible evidence establishing another link between uh, Kemet, Kush, East Africa, and West Africa. And then I was in Chicago, uh, early part of all, driving along Lakeshore Drive, and I saw that same symbol. Then Alina sent me a photograph from a book on a uh, Kushite tomb in Nuri, the site of their royal tombs, and we find the same image carved in the tomb. So we got to do some additional research, and hopefully next, next year we'll have an opportunity to actually go to Sudan, go to these sites and do some excavations. One of the uh, scholars that we met from Sudan at the Nile Valley Conference uh, invited us to come to Sudan. He said that there are tombs there that have never been excavated. And that he would speak with the Minister of Culture and give us a permit to come. So hopefully, uh, if we can make arrangements, that will be um, another journey that we'll make. But Karakamoon always has this habit of delivering a big surprise at the end of the season. Last season, we found a burial change. At the end of this season, we found something new that I'll, I'll close on. Uh, well, I'll begin to close on. Uh, we had a team of geologists from Swansea University in Wales who were there for two weeks with ground penetrating radar. And they scanned the entire area and they found what they, what they have described as spaces, cavities that extend 100 feet in front of the opening to Barack Obama's tomb. We don't know what we'll find next year. But we ended the season on a high note where this is, <clears throat> this is the uh, floor plan of the tomb and this is the entrance to the tomb. And at the eastern entrance of the courtyard in early September, Alina sent me an email and said, Tony, we found something new, something stark. They found a room at the eastern end of the <coughs> courtyard. And there was a space about this high that they were able to crawl inside of. And inside of that room, they found these drawings of daily life scenes of the Kushites. The first drawings of daily life scenes ever found in Kemet. Mm -hmm. They extended all the way around the room. There were scenes of here you see someone with a cow. Uh, there were scenes of people picking grapes here. There were scenes of people pressing grapes with their feet. There's another scene of uh, several groups of men pressing grapes in a large device. All of these scenes are old kingdom scenes that are similar, if not identical, to scenes in the necropolises of Saqqara and Giza. Another example of retrieving images from the past and incorporating them into the tomb. There's this wonderful, I don't have it in, in this slide, but um, there's a wonderful scene of several musicians. Two harpists 
someone playing an instrument similar to a banjo. Uh, two women dancing and a brother snapping his fingers. Uh, <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. So next year, this is what we're going to be exhibiting. Closing down now, the ACE Restoration Project is dedicated to this man, Dr. A.C. G. Healy III, an educational psychologist. Uh, one of his most significant books is Sabre. If they have it outside, I would encourage you to buy that book. Don't just read it, study it. Sabre, the reawakening of the African mind, Sabre is a comedic word that means to be wise. And we gain wisdom through study and teaching. It's not enough just to read. You have to share what you know with others. And it's in the process of teaching that your real learning begins. Sabre is a prerequisite for C, an insight, knowledge of self. It's through the application of knowledge that we transform ourselves and ultimately transform the world. Ace of Restoration Project. Take down that website, aceofrestorationproject.com. That is where you can go <coughs> make a, a contribution via PayPal to support the work that we're doing. The project is dedicated to the restoration of the Kushite presence in Kemet and the preservation of the legacy of Dr. A.C. G. Hilliard today. That is how you honor your ancestors, by remembering them and ensuring that their names will live forever. That's what Columbus Day is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Someone comes into your home, discovers it, <laughs> right, and makes a hero out of that person. Uh, it's all relative, you know. So we have a hero that we can honor. What we're doing through the A.C. Project, we're looking for 400 people we're willing to make a contribution, an annual contribution of $120, $20 a year. That gives us the $40,000 a year necessary to do the excavation at this site. All we need is 400 people. Black folks spend over a billion dollars a year on potato chips and tennis shoes. Right. It's a trillion. It's a trillion, okay. So $120 a month for 400 people, $120 a year for 400 people is not a lot of money to ask. We want to take 40 people on missions next year. We want to help train the next generation of Jokers, Clarks, Mims, Jacksons, Obingas. We can do that. We can do that if we choose to. We help it to establish cultural circles, action-oriented study groups. We develop a curriculum where we can prepare you to begin to study this knowledge. Connect the 25th Dynasty with the other three golden ages so that you can go out into the community, to the children's schools, and talk about this information intelligently, to raise awareness of this aspect of history, which we are documenting. We don't have to make anything up because we have the evidence. We have the hard code evidence. So the question that I'm always asked is, Whiff, Whiff, what's in it for me? <laughs> Why should I invest in this project? should invest in this project because it will pay dividends for generations. You can come to be a part of the mission. You can put your hand into soil that's 2,700 years old and find artifacts and restore a tomb, your ancestral tomb. We have youth who have been coming to D.C. to take out Egypt on the Potomac field. Again, you can make a pledge online. You can check payable to IBDCC. Uh, I feel Robert telling me Tony finished up. I won't have enough time. I hear you, Robert. I hear you. Right. <laughs> this past April, we had a group of students from a high school in Champaign, Illinois, in Southern Illinois. They came to D.C., took our Egypt on the Potomac Field Trip, this three-hour activity where we showed them evidence of the creation of the capital, the wealthiest, most powerful nation in, in human history, it was predicated upon. Uh, replicating the architecture, the mythology, and the symbolism of the ancient Nile Valley and the Potomac River Valley. And these students absorbed this information, went back home to their classroom, and for the summer service learning project, they created a museum. A museum entitled Vision, Africa Through the Eyes of Heru. It had four rooms where they recreated everything that we talked about on our field trip. They recreated it. High school students, 15-year-old youth. And they opened it to the community and began the process of transforming their community because they found themselves in history. And they were proud of what they saw. You know, their motto was, our vision has been blurred, but now we can clear it up. How's that for a testimony? We have right down the road, the Dessert Club. 
Ali and Helen Saladin for the past 12 years have taken over 3,000 youth and adults to the Nile Valley. So the process is set in motion. Process which a colleague of mine has referred to as the metamorphosis. <laughs> the transformation that comes upon a person once they are introduced to true history, to the history of chemistry. And when you see yourself recorded favorably in history, you make a psychological and a spiritual connection with that history, and it transforms you. So that's the process. This is where we are. And we end this process giving you a heads up, because this man in two years, Will Smith, has in production a film called The Last Pharaoh, in which he's going to play to Harker, the last major king of the 25th dynasty. So two years from now, we want hundreds of thousands of people to go to the movie theater the first weekend to see this film. I don't care how good it is, how accurate it is, I want you to go see this film to support this man. And then discuss the historical accuracies or inaccuracies of this film, but have an informed discussion. 25th Dynasty, this is the Harker, the last major king of the 25th Dynasty. The same dynasty that we are excavating right now. So we're providing the opportunity and the evidence to have an important conversation. So I close with a basic acknowledgement that we are the ancestors. We are the vessels to which the ancestors speak and do their best work. But you've got to prepare your mind. And as the brother said before I came up, you've also got to prepare your body. And with the whole mind, with the sound mind, and the sound body, you can begin to do the work that you were born here on earth to do. Thank you. Um, right about now, uh, Robert's ready to go, but I wanted to know if you guys would like a 10 minute break, yes. look, fire, yeah. stretch your legs, and then come back. Greetings, okay. everybody. Peace. We Peace. back. We, uh, Right now we're gonna do, we're gonna bring in the uh, speaker Robert Revolve, but first we're gonna have uh, Anthony Browder. He's gonna give a special introduction to him. So everybody, I give you Anthony Browder. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I don't want to take a lot of time with the introduction. I just want to make a few short Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make one point. At, at the first Nile Valley Conference, which was held in 1984, there was this relatively unknown author from Cornell University. I know, it's just a setup, Robert, it's a setup. A relatively unknown author from Cornell University named Mark Bernard wrote a book called Black Athena. And that book played a pivotal role in, in the African Center movement of the 80s and early 90s. We just had a Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta several weeks ago. And we had an author, Robert Duvall, who just wrote a book called Black Genesis, a book that will similarly have a profound effect how we see ourselves in the world. So without any further ado, mm -hmm.